Sì, benissimo. Allora ben, do intanto il benvenuto a tutte e a tutti. Grazie naturalmente di essere qui. E un benvenuto speciale naturalmente al nostro ospite, il professor Basile. Sono molto rammaricato di non poter essere lì a Siena, insomma, di non averla potuto accogliere eh, personalmente, ma sono stato visitato dal Covid e quindi diciamo sono impossibilitato a, a muovermi perché ho un ospite indesiderato ma uh, spero che avremo altre occasioni insomma ecco per poterci incontrare intanto grazie mille <coughs> di aver accolto il nostro il nostro invito e di essere qui oggi ci fa moltissimo piacere naturalmente ascoltarla e oggi è l'ottavo e ultimo uh, incontro della prima tranche diciamo così dei nostri seminari del martedì eh, abbiamo fatto appunto otto incontri da marzo Uh, a oggi, e, e, come è un po' la caratteristica dei nostri appuntamenti, gli incontri si sono mossi su una serie di temi, eh, ambiti cronologici, prospettive molto diverse tra loro, ma uno dei, degli intenti di questo incontro è proprio quello di far dialogare diverse prospettive, diverse discipline e, e quindi da questo punto di vista siamo molto soddisfatti naturalmente del del percorso che anche quest'anno siamo riusciti a fare eh, il numero di appuntamenti è cresciuto rispetto agli ultimi anni ne abbiamo fatti quattro, ce ne saranno almeno cinque forse sei eh, in autunno e quindi insomma eh, l'offerta si arricchisce per così dire, abbiamo anche aggiunto alcune pre presentazioni di libri eh, ne abbiamo fatto uno eh, di, di Gianluca De Santis a Roma prima di Roma, uh, in maggio, ne faremo un altro a ottobre con il volume La nave di Caronte, pubblicato da, eh, scritto da eh, Tommaso Braccini e eh, Luigi Silvano, che presenteremo appunto il 25 eh, ottobre. E, eh, siamo molto onorati di avere sempre un certo interesse eh, da parte del pubblico che ci segue e eh, che si vede in particolare nel momento della discussione del dibattito e eh, speriamo che continui a essere così naturalmente perché eh, lo scopo di questi seminari è proprio quello di stimolare il dialogo, il, il dibattito <coughs> con eh, gli studiosi che volta a volta ospitiamo e, e siamo certi, insomma, continuerà a essere uno dei tratti caratteristici dei nostri eh, seminari. E io non voglio dire molto altro perché non voglio togliere eh, tempo al motivo per cui siamo tutti qua, cioè ascoltare eh, la presentazione del professor Basile. E, e ricordo quindi semplicemente in conclusione che eh, i seminari riprenderanno il 4 ottobre con... Eh, di Ivan Matiasic che parlerà di Filocoro e il passato ateniese e a seguire l'11 ottobre ci sarà Federico Sant'Angelo che parlerà di Bodel e eh, del suo impatto nella storiografia eh, sul mondo antico. Eh, vi aspettiamo naturalmente anche per quelle, eh, per quelle occasioni e daremo come al solito ampia eh, diffusione e pubblicità a questi incontri secondo eh, i canali consueti. Benissimo, allora non mi resta che ringraziare ancora tutti i presenti per la loro partecipazione, ringraziare il professor Basile per aver così cortesemente accolto il nostro invito. E passo a voi la parola allora. Benissimo, io spero che mi sentiate. Eh, ringrazio a mia volta il professor Ferrucci e tutta l'organizzazione del Centro AMA per aver accolto questa proposta. Ringrazio soprattutto l'amico e collega Gaston Javier Basile per aver accettato l'invito a presentare le sue ultime ricerche in questi nostri martedì. E vi informo delle sue attività, delle, delle sue ricerche molto rapidamente prima di lasciargli la parola. Eh, con Gaston e eh, con questa conferenza diciamo scendiamo verso limiti cronologici un po' più bassi rispetto a quelli abituali negli incontri del 
martedì, anche se Gaston è un classicista puro, diciamo così, di formazione, in particolare è proprio un grecista, insegna greco alla Università di Buenos Aires, e anche se si occupa naturalmente come filologo classico sia di greco che di latino, e ha, ha avuto eh, ruoli, incarichi eh, in diverse università e centri di studio europei come il Warburg Institute di Londra, come la Humboldt Université di eh, Berlino. E, attualmente è il fellow a, al centro della Villa Itatti, all'Harvard Center eh, di Firenze, dove appunto sta svolgendo la ricerca di cui presenta qui uno degli aspetti. Una ricerca che eh, dal punto di vista personale è molto eh, vicino ad alcuni interessi di ricerca che anche qui si stanno seguendo, come appunto la nomenclatura scientifica e la eh, semantica dei nomi di piante o di animali o di... Eh, malattie o di rimedi medici eh, che dal greco vengono trasmessi in latino e hanno in latino una, una propria vitalità. Tra l'altro Gastone era stato già ospite dell'Università di Siena alcuni anni fa quando eravamo io e la professoressa Bartoli ad Arezzo e io allora dirigevo il, il dipartimento, lui è stato appunto eh, visiting scholar eh, per le sue ricerche allora in particolare su Poliziano mi ricordo un seminario sul eh, significato del nome del rinoceronte secondo un'antica eh, e complessa eh, sequenza di diffrazioni di, del nome di questo animale dal fisiologo greco all'umanesimo ora quella traccia si è allargata molto e appunto siamo curiosi di ascoltare questo suo eh, seminario. Ti ringrazio molto e ti lascio la parola. Bene, eh, eh, ringrazio, ringrazio il professore Ferrucci, eh, purtroppo no, non ci siamo visti in, 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 di persona, ma capisco ben, perfettamente la situazione perché anch'io ho vissuto la stessa cosa cioè, pochi, pochi mesi fa. Poi anche ringrazio uh, tanto Francesco eh, che ormai ci conosciamo da conosciamo da, da tanti anni. E, e beh, e questa, questa relazione che farò oggi um, la, la terrò in inglese perché appunto è parte di un lavoro che sto scrivendo in inglese, quindi eh, sebbene cioè, parlo italiano, avevo tutte le fonti, tutto il testo in inglese, quindi lo, 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 lo farò eh, in inglese. Well, um, my, to my, my, my topic today is something that has been long neglected and uh, has only fairly recently started to get the attention it deserves, right? The, the humanist translations of Greek texts. Um, for example, writing in 2007, Maria Rosa Cortesi, which was, was the director of the Italian project Edizione Nazionale delle Traduzioni dei, dei Testi Greci in Età Umanistica e Rinascimentale, said, and I quote, stanno cadendo pure alcuni pregiudizi sulle traduzioni umanistiche, ma è ancora lontana una storia delle versioni nel secolo XV, poiché scarse le edizioni critiche, poche le analisi puntuali e filologicamente attendibili dei singoli testi. Um, e... In the last decade, important efforts have been made to redress this prejudice and neglect of the humanist translations from Greek. A titanic intellectual effort spanning the Quattrocento and early Cinquecento, which, as Eugenio Garin and Paul Christola repeatedly noted, played a vital role in catalyzing the cultural uh, revolution in the Renaissance. The work ahead is enormous. Mm. It, not, For example, by, as shown by the two-volume Repertorio delle Traduzioni Umanistiche a Stampa, uh, edited by Maria Rosa Cortesi and Silvia Fiaschi in 2008, not to mention the many times as daunting manuscript tradition. Um, within this large humanist translation scheme, or retranslation sometimes, so it's both translation of new texts and retranslation of old texts, 
Uh, my focus has been on the reception and translation of scientific literature, and more particularly, uh, the humanist interest in natural history and uh, medicine in particular. In this presentation, I will look at some of the challenges that the Italian humanists faced when translating and explicating scientific literature in particular. Their reflection on language, translation, and the natural world, and the role played by interpre interpretatio, that is both translation and interpretation, as a form of transfer and knowledge making. I don't intend to offer any conclusive observations on what is still a largely unexplored territory, but provide some insight into the vast humanist scientific retranslation program from a translation studies approach, especially the cultural approach to translation that has developed in the last decades. So first, I'd like to say a few words about what is it that we understand by translation and why translation matters. So when we speak of translation, I'm not thinking about it purely in terms of an interlingual phenomenon and the debates regarding the fidelity, questions of formal equivalence, or purely the stylistic or rhetorical differences between source and target text. Uh, this is central to translation, but it's only a small part of it. Uh, translation is much more than a simple converse, uh, conversion from lang one language to another. There is an interdiscursive and intercultural dimension to it which often takes precedence over the text itself. There is a very, there's a very, um, I don't know whether it's well known, but I, I found it very interesting, an anecdote about uh, Augustine, yeah, writing letters to Jerome. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, there's a letter he writes, Jerome was translating the, the Bible, and he was, uh, the Old Testament particularly, uh, and he was doing it directly from Hebrew. Uh, which in many places uh, differed from the, from the Septuagint. So there's a point in, in that Augustine says the following, right? When one of our brothers, a bishop, had introduced the use of your translation, I mean, Jerome's translation, in the church of which he is the priest, the, go the congregation hit upon a passage in the prophet Jonah, which you translated in a very different way from the way it had established itself in the mind and memory of all, Omnium sensibus memoriaeque, and the way it had been sung for such a long time. Great unrest arose among the people, especially since the Greeks protested and began to shout about falsification. As a result, the priest saw himself forced to rely on the Jews who lived in the city to clear up the matter. But they replied either out of ignorance or out of malice that the Hebrew manuscripts contained exactly what also was to be found in the Greek and Latin manuscripts. And then what? To escape from great danger, the man was forced to correct himself as if he had made a mistake, since he did not want to lose all the people in his church. Okay. So um, I think this is a very uh, interesting anecdote, right? To think about the, the cultural dimensions of translation, right? So. Uh, it shows that translations cannot be only judged by their quality or their accuracy in universal terms, but are contextually determined. They are historic products that affect and reshape the literary canon of the target culture. Uh, so the, in the last 30 years, there has been what you call the cultural turn in translation studies, uh, which was started by scholars like Susan Basnet, André Lefebvre, and Lawrence Venuti in the 90s. And they started speaking about translation as a contextual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So it's a historical enterprise and a product of a target culture. And as such, it cannot be explained exclusively in terms of linguistic correspondence between languages. They also started speaking of translation as a form of rewriting. Mm -hmm. So. A translation is a rewriting of a text in, in reality. So they place the focus on, on, on process rather than the product of translation, the emphasis on the target polysystem of culture in the translation processes, and also 
other factors in the transfer process, like uh, knowledge transfer, institutions, agents, power, patronage, and the struggles within an intellectual field. Um, they also started connecting translation with other linguistic phenomena, like reading, writing, interpretation, commentary, etc. So here we have just a few uh, quotes, for example, Umberto Eco, who says precisely, translation is always a shift, not between two languages, but between two cultures or two encyclopedias. A translator must take into account rules that are not strictly linguistic, but broadly speaking, cultural. More recently, the focus on the target text to the detriment of the source text has become still more radical. And here we have another citation, more recent one. Uh, Cultural translation may be understood as a process in which there is no source text and usually no fixed target text. The focus is cultural processes rather than products. The prime cause of cultural translation is the movement of people, subjects, rather than the movement of texts, objects. Moreover, and this is especially important to my um, research because I, I'm, I'm working on scientific texts. Translation is also a cognitive operation. So hermeneutic practices are involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we have a citation from Filmer who says, what happens when one comprehends a text is that one mentally creates a kind of world. The properties of this world may depend quite a bit on the individual interpreter's private experiences, a reality which should account for the part of, of the fact that different people construct different interpretations of the same text. So there is a very important cognitive element to translation. And this is very important, I think, when dealing with particularly difficult texts like scientific texts. Uh, so translation is primarily a form of close reading and therefore a hermeneutic operation. Well, so now I'm going to focus more directly after this introduction on what happened in the Quattrocento as some of these texts, some of these scientific texts started being translated to uh, Neo-Latin, right? So to start with this, I would like to read yes, a, a section of a letter in the vernacular uh, written by Poliziano, Angelo Poliziano, the famous uh, philologist, and poet to uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, eh, where he requests a revision of his translations of Hippocrates and Galen by the court physician Pier Leoni da Spoleto. And he says, Vorrei che vostra magnificenza intendessi se maestro Pier Leoni volesse durar fatica in riveder quella mia traduzione di Ippocrate e Galieno, che è quasi al fine. E così è il commento che fu sopra, dove dichiaro tutti i termini medicinali che vengono dal greco e trovo come si possono chiamare latine. Se la sua eccellenza volesse durar fatica, poi al tempo lo manderei fuori più arditamente, che stimo sarà bella cosa e utile, se la morna me ne inganna. Messer Armola e il, il conte mostrano pur di averne buona opinione. There's a, a very interesting passage of a letter in the Poliziano, it's a letter in the vernacular. There were not too many he tended to write in Latin. But here, it, there's something very interesting about this. It, unfortunately, his translation of Galen and Hippocrates did not survive. They, they, they disappeared, right? But here we have some you know, important things that concern our object, right? First, he shows a keen awareness of the cross-disciplinary demands of the translation of science, right? A task that not even Poliziano, who was perhaps the, the greatest philologist of its time, could do without the help of a medical expert, right? So he's asking, you know, to have his translations revised and by a physician, a, a doctor. Second, what is important is that he mentions terminology as the main focus in the review. 
of the manuscripts because terminology was the major problem in uh, translation science. And finally, the letter is interesting because it talks about the attention to the social status and intellectual networks of the interpres, the, the translation and commentator in Quattrocento Italy, which was a complex activity that fostered both collaboration and competition within and across academic circles. So this letter to Poliziano, uh, to Lorenzo, speaks of a very demanding intellectual effort the translation of Greek medical and scientific texts, which spanned the second half of the 15th century. Leading Italian humanists took part in this challenge as they became engaged in an ambitious retranslation scheme of the Greek legacy. Humanist scientific translations, many of which served to renew interest in not long neglected classical authors, took the form of a complex interdiscursive operation that involved the emendation or expurgation of manuscripts and the rendering of such Greek texts into Latin and later on into the vernacular. As, as mentioned earlier, interpretatio was the hallmark of early humanism. It was a primary, a primary concern of philologists and physicians willing to engage in the natural world. Indeed, the Italian Quattrocento saw an unprecedented interest in natural science. Humanists such as Francesco Filel, Fotiodoro Gaza, and Molao Barbaro took part in the translation of Greek words like Hippocrates, Aristotle's uh, Libri Naturalis, Theophrastus, and Dioscorides. Often discussing their translation practices and debating the correct interpretation of texts in prefaces to the first editions and in their personal correspondence. The works of Hippocrates and Galen were also retranslated or translated by practicing physicians like Niccolò Leonicino or Lorenzo Lorenzi, who often took pride in combining philological and medical expertise. Controversies arose between scholars translating the same texts as shown, for example, between the, the, the fight between Gadza and Giorgio Trapezunzio over Aristotle's problemata. Humanist scientific translations took the form of a complex operation. This involved the emendation of manuscripts, as well as a sustained re-engagement with well-known encyclopedic, encyclopedic texts such as Pliny's Natural History, but also the mainstream Arab Latin medical tradition. In tandem with the new translations, scientific, Latin scientific terminology was re-examined. Uh, this developed into discussions about the adequateness of lexical items and their reference in the real world. Most importantly, the humanist engagement with these texts not only called into question the humanist rhetoric-based approach to translation, as famously advocated by Leonardo Bruni, but also significantly reshaped the understanding of the naturalium by foregrounding the articulation between res and verba, that is, things and words. Um, humanism can be regarded as the landmark in the translator's visibility and as a transition stage that paved the way for the modern status of translation as a relatively autonomous field of inquiry. We can say that during the Middle Ages, translation was barely distinguished from other erudite or didactic procedures, such as glossing, annotating, paraphrasing, editing, and rewriting. Uh, hence, in the, in the, during the Middle Ages, translation as such did not elicit such a big intellectual, uh, you know, theoretical, say, theoretical, um, interest per se as such. Uh, the medieval translation uh, translator generally performed the role of textual critic and editor of texts, uh, thus not producing a substitute, but rather a supplement or an adjunct to mediate between the source text and the reader. Uh, 
while it would be mistaken to assume a radical break with earlier medieval practices, the humanist's retranslation agenda implied the formation of a new canon of works, the remolding of classical autorites, as well as the adoption of an increasingly rhetoric-based approach to translation, which would also reach a new readership. The idea of translation as a substitute for the original, rather than as a supplement, started to be felt more close, more strongly in the early Renaissance. Moreover, the translator acquired a more independent status and a prominent social role. Um, this awareness paved the way for the first treatises dealing specifically with translation as such, like Bruni's and uh, Manetti's uh, treatises on translation. More importantly, the relationship between the source and the target text was gradually seen as mediated by historical dis uh, dif distance. This historical gap required an expert individual capable of producing an equivalent effect in the target audience, now felt as detached from the classical past. For the more, the humanist translation, uh, translator became even more aware of language variations and cross-cultural differences which took the form of intellectual debates regarding the prestige of Greek, Latin, and the vernacular languages, as well as controversies over the refashioning and consolidate, uh, consolidation of the target language, Neo-Latin, in uh, the case of translations from Greek. Okay, uh, so now let's move a bit to what are the challenges posed by scientific translation. Right, because most of the translated work were literary works. I mean, the vast majority also philosophical works. But what about these scientific texts like Aristotle, um, Dioscorides, Theophrastus, who was practically discovered in, I mean, discovered as a and translated in by Gaza in the uh, 15th century. In, in modern understanding, a scientific translation tends to be seen as a subclass of the general theory of translation and is generally understood as a form of specialized or technical field clearly distinguished from the translation of literary texts. Um, in, the, in, the middle, in the Renaissance, both literary and non-literary texts were dealt with roughly in similar ways with a focus on the stylistic and rhetorical standards, especially in these humanist translations. The classical Latin models were used to render the Greek texts into elegant Latin or Neo-Latin. However, humanists were not unaware of the specific difficulties posed by these texts, especially in terms of lexis and subject matter. The questions of loans, neologisms, and semantic cults, as well as the accurate interpretation of the specialized content, figured prominently in humanist debates. The questions of neologisms, for example, had surfaced in the early humanist debates about the renovation and expansion of the Latin linguistic capital. Nonetheless, the approach was for the most part philological and did not make meaningful distinctions in terms of discourse genres or specific branches of knowledge. Positions varied among humanists, some of whom adopted a classicist stance that, that was contrary to innovation, to others that were more had a more innovative approach, like Lorenzo Valla, Biondo Flavio, and Bartolomeo Scala, who based their linguistic, linguistic criteria on usage, usus, and were therefore more prone to linguistic innovation. Uh, the more innovative postures stemmed from an embryonic socio-historical insight into language use, which started to consider the changing social reality and the concomitant linguistic change. In general, the tendency was to expurgate the scholastic Latin inherited from mid medieval times in the light of the classical sources and their own explicit rules of word formation and composition. In matters of style, uh, Cicero was the model of imitation. 
especially among those who advocated the imitation of a single author rather than a wide assortment of texts. Okay. Words that evoke a direct referential link with reality are commonly known as realia, right? Many of the humanist discussions over the no, nova, we, uh, nova verba, that is, the new words, arose from a mis mismatch between the extra-linguistic realities of source and target culture that is classical antiquity and early modern Europe, respectively. Yes. Uh, in translation studies, the interpretation and translation of the realia is generally very problematic, even today. And translators adopt different strategies to deal with these cultural gaps, from suppression of the culturally awkward item to various forms of mediation in the target language. So what problems did these, did these realia cause, right? The translation of science poses similar difficulties to that translation as interlingual mediator, but slightly in different ways. The referential dimension of language is also central to scientific discourse. But unlike cultural objects and pra practices which shift considerably in different times and settings, natural objects and phenomena remain a lot more stable. Such is the case with zoological, botanical, and medical reference. The humanist translators of Greek scientific texts did not only have to ironize linguistic difficulties, but were also compelled to tackle a more complex epistemological problem, the identification of these realia that were designated by a maze of confusing terms. Um, so, for example, here we have a quotation of, I think it's in your handout, it's number, it's text number two. This is a letter uh, sent by Niccolò Perotti, who declares he is appalled, yes, he's surprised, and he, by the rare words he finds in the classical sources. Uh, which his contemporaries claim to understand and wonders about their exact meaning. Um, so, what is a, you, the phrasing of the rhetorical questions shows that the referent is a, a stake here. Like, uh, who, he says, who would know, oh, sorry. For who or how many are now able to understand or explain what the opinion about which the, this witty poet writes? Who knows the meaning of tuburum and apinorum, also used by this poet? Who could tell what kind is the melis among the quadrupeds, the phenicopterus among the birds, the lupus among the fishes, which was reportedly caught between the two bridges in Rome, the redivius among the fowls, the mixa among the trees, the mustacae among the bushes, the cariota among the fruits. Moreover, what parts of the living body are the gula, stomachus, praecordia, lactis, omasum, vulva, vulva, loki, lotri, and so on and so forth? While everybody seems to understand these words, most people, in fact, ignore what they mean. Right. Yeah. He says that uh, omnibus videantur ignorantur tamen a pluribus. Yeah. So he's raising the question of what these words actually are. What are the references of these words? He's finding in, in he's talking about a poem from Marshall, yeah, Marciale, Marciale, and uh, he comes up with these words and nobody understands what they mean. What is the reference? of these words. So the major problem here is the, the reference. You also have another passage here, which is a poem, a pastoral poem by another humanist. This was written in uh, 19, uh, 1494 by Bartolomeo Scala. It's a, it's a 
a poem called the Arboribus, which he dedicated to Lorenzo de' Medici. And here, he very much asks the same questions as Perotti, right? He says, um, I, I can translate it like quickly. Now I shall sing the praises of fruits, fair, soft shelled, many colored, fragrant gifts of the gods. So many species and so variously named, they are hard to run into verse. Redere verso, no? Who would know the crustumia pear trees or the lofty volema or the names lavish antiquity once used? The names of things have died out with things themselves or the things have been obscured by the change of names. So we shall sing along with our well-known names. So in this section of the poem, Scala begins to sing about the different times of fruits, poma, we have it there, but declares himself baffled by the number of species, tam multa species or species, and the various names, tam multa wokamina, that complicate his poetic composition. He wonders who is capable of understanding the difficult names, nomina, given by the ancients. So he offers two explanations. First, those names given to natural things have died out or become lost, along with the things themselves. Or second, the things themselves have been obscured by the change of names. That's why he says, mutatis verbis. Finally, he announces that his poem will adopt the names he and his contemporaries use and are capable of understanding. Nostris intellectis quem nominibus. In these verses, Scala builds poetically on a debate that kept a humanist busy for several decades. The adequate understanding of the names given to plant species and natural realia and the ways in which linguistic change and the passage of time have, have obscured the identification of such realia. Okay, so so how do we translate science? What happens when we uh, translate scientific texts? What methods were adopted? particularly in the phase of the terminological difficulties and in the phase of the content, the subject matter difficulties, right? That were many times hand in hand. Um, here we have, for example, this is number four in your handout, I think. Uh, the a section of a, a preface to Pope Nicholas for the translation of Aristotle's zoolo zoological works written in 1450 by George of Trebizond. Yes, George of Trebizond was um, I mean, a well-known humanist uh, and he was a Greek emigre, right? And he was the first who, to undertake translation of, of, of Aristotle's uh, Libri Naturae, right? Um, in this passage, Trebizond says that in order to translate Aristotle's zoological works, he read all that the Latin authors had written on animals, right? Omnia legia put latinus, since he confessed he was badly informed about the topic. Interestingly, interestingly, he reports that some of the solutions he found to translate the obscure Greek terms arose from his close reading of these texts. For example, matching the information he happened to read on a specific species of animal in Aristotle's work with an equivalent one in the Latin corpus in order to derive the appropriate nomenclature. Yeah. So he gives the example of the Greek glanis, that is a type of fish, right? Trebizon states that according to Aristotle, the male glanis, masculos, he says masculos uh, glanidas, protect their offspring from predators until they are capable of fending for themselves. Since this behavior is attributed to the silurus in the Latin sources, 
Trebizond says that he adopted the Latin term silurus every time Aristotle mentions the glanis. In other cases, he mentions further on, the Latin texts provide the equivalent term of the Greek, as in the case of the Greek belone, that is a sea fish, also called acus, and the Greek eruthinos, also known as Rubeolus, a fish, a fish of red color. Finally, he says that whenever the equivalent Greek and Latin terms were not available, he used the Greek term with a slight adaptation to the Latin form. Yes, he says, um, ad formam latinam commutata. So he changed the word, yes, in the Latin form. So this threefold method Prebison reportedly uses is based on a close reading of the source text with a focus on the information provided about the different species, followed by a correlation with the information given in the Latin texts. So the direction he seems to, to be taking is that from res to verba, I mean, identifying what the, the thing itself is and then trying to find the correct names. Um, so this approach he's taking is consistent with some guideline, guidelines for translation right, that Trevisan gives elsewhere. For example, uh, in a text he writes against uh, Theodore Gaza's translation of Aristotle's Problemata. So both Trevisan and Gaza translated this text, but Gaza's text became the the accepted one, and Trebizons was, was pushed back. Here, uh, Trebizon makes very interesting observations about how to translate science, particularly, which is very uh, peculiar for uh, a humanist, right? He says that the main important, the main thing in order to translate is to correctly understand the text. He says, if you don't understand, don't translate. Okay, uh, so, uh, and this is obviously a criticism against Gaza, who, according to him, and if you compare both translations, you may sort of sometimes agree with Prebism. Uh, Gaza did not always understand what, what, he, what, what he was translating, and he made several mistakes, particularly with vocabulary, right? So for Trebism, the main important, the main idea is that you should understand really what the, the census, he says, the census argumentorum is, the, 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 the force of the, of the sense and the argument. It, this implied not sacrificing the accurate rendering of the content of the text for the sake of eloquence, as Gaza appeared to have done in his translation. So the word-for-word -word method adopted by the medieval predecessors, uh, whom the humanists bitterly attacked in their retranslation scheme, and we can think of Leonardo Bruni, and who always attacks the medieval translations of Aristotle, yes, as barbarian and shoddy, and you know, in Trebizond's view, in for the translation of science, that method is not bad. So. Being more literal, yes, uh, closely understanding the meaning of the text and going from the things to the words rather than from the words to the words, as many humanists did, was the right method for translating science. Mm -hmm. So that's why he, he um, prebisoned, he lays down a sort of a rule for, for translation. And he says, uh, this is the rule that the learned, the learned should observe when translating, that more serious and difficult matters be rendered almost word for word. And historical and easier matters like literature to be treated with more or less, you know, freedom as they think appropriate, he says. So he makes this very, uh, you know, clear distinction between um, different different ways of translating a text okay um there's a lot more to say about this um i want to talk a bit about medical humanists mm. 
medical humanists opened a new, new perspectives. These were people who were both humanists and doctors, right, or physicians. Uh, the retranslation of gender of the 15th century humanists implied a substantial shift in translation norms. As mentioned, translation became an increasingly target-oriented activity and the acceptability of translation was judged by the extent to which it conformed to the stylistic rules of classical Latin, which the humanists tried to imitate. This became very problematic, as we mentioned, for scientific literature. Um, the controversies over Greek and Latin lexical equivalences, as well as the correlation of res and verba, are two salient ways in which such, such discrepancies started to take shape in the second half of the Quattrocento. It is among medical humanists discussing the meaning of natural terminology in Latin sources, particularly Pliny's natural history, and embarking on the taxing translation of Greek medical corpus, particularly Hippocrates and Galen, that these discussions were taken to the next level. Um, in your uh, handout, you have text number six that comes from um, a work published by Niccolò Ioniceno. Ioniceno was a professor of medicine at Ferrara uh, in the 15th century. He lived like for a hundred years, and he was a very prominent physician in his time. And he wrote this work in which he uh, mentioned, he criticized many botanical, medical, and yeah, scientific errors that he found in Pliny's text, right? Um, so in this uh, text number six, he says, that the prime difficulty in the development of bot botanical knowledge stems from the obscurity of the names in the classical authors. Prisca earum nomina sunt nobis ignota. Moreover, the description of the species through explicit references is often equivocal. These difficulties in learning and teaching botany are not only due to the mystification of names as they were handed down by the authors, but also stem from the materia itself. So here he starts giving, you know, arguments or reasons or explanations that have to do with his botanical and his medical knowledge. He says, for example, that the seasonal growth of plants makes the identification difficult. And the variety of colors and shapes of species, he says, colores ad figuras, further complicates the process. Um, even if, if Leonicello does not explicitly say so, one should avow that the same material constraints of botanical science must have operated in antiquity and in his own time. Yet things became further complicated by the fact that the modern's task is twice as difficult, since they must unravel a maze of names, which were probably not accurately allotted in the first place. Right? So humanists had to deal with names that were not, in the beginning, very precisely you know, allocated. Interestingly, Leonicheno's arguments are far more sophisticated than the humanists debates over the correct names. While he acknowledges that scribal errors and a flawed manuscript tradition have played a major part in the errors in scientific texts, he is also aware that botany is a complicated di discipline per se. Botany is complicated. And that errors or inconsistencies in the identification and naming of species may well be a problem of the ancient texts themselves. So this, he says, has created a confusion uh, among doctor, doctors in his own time. And in the next passage, right, he talks about, we're not going to read this, right? But he says that it's passage number seven. Here he talks about the, the division between things and words. 
this division may have dire consequences, omni periculo, for practicing doctors who, mis misled by the names, are likely to administer the wrong medicine to their patients. So Leoniceno, I think uh, his main contribution, you see this in the whole uh, book on uh, the, uh, Pliny's errors, and he, and now we're going to show you another example from a translation of Galen, he's always worried about the consequences, you know, the practical consequences. So doctors and botanists that have to prescribe a medicine and they get the wrong name and, the, and therefore the wrong medicine may kill a person. Right? or may produce harm to a person, right? So he's very worried about this. Um, very good. So, philology and medical expertise. So the contribution of medical humanists was not only limited to the correct interpretation of scientific terminology, sometimes an incorrect translation or an unreliable variant in the original could change the interpretation of a whole passage, which could also pose problems for the teaching and practice of medicine, right? Um, I have brought here an example, a very brief example where we can't we don't have much time to see it very much in depth, but it's one of the texts I'm working on. Uh, this is a um, Leoniceno trans uh, translated Galen's, uh, I mean, Hippocrates and Galen's commentary, right? Retranslated it because there was a translatio antiqua. There was a there was an old translator a translation, a medieval translation from the uh, 12th century that was it was thought to have been produced by Constantine the African but uh, from Arabic, but now scholars have, uh, you know, agreed that it, this Antiqua Translatio, the, the medieval translation, is actually from a Greek text. It was, was made from a Greek text. So this was the, the, the um, translation in circulation, okay? There was also a very important commentary uh, produced by the, the Florentine physician Piero, uh, Pietro Torrigiano, uh, who produced this substantial commentary, commentary on the art of medicine, uh, and he was called the plusquam commentator because he 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 wrote, wrote this voluminous work commenting uh, Galen, right? So basically, what humanists in general and and Leoniceno here in particular, they're trying to do is that they show that uh, there there were errors in these earlier translations, and that produced a misinterpretation of the text. Uh, this was not always the case. It's not that the medieval translations were bad, as bad as the humanists claimed, but sometimes uh, they were more literal, they were much more literal, which, for example, as we saw in Trebizond's view, it's good, right, that they are literal. But uh, for uh, Leonid Shader wants to show that there were problems uh, with the translation and therefore certain passages were misinterpreted. Um, here, for example, you have it in the, um, in, the, in the handout. This is a passage from uh, Galen's The Art of Medicine, right? And there is a problem here with basically a connector, right? One Greek word. Hmm? Um, the, the Greek word is the, this uh, connector, a, right, or eta, right, which have different meanings. The, the problem here is that a large group of the manuscripts, I would say half of the manuscripts transmit one lectio, as usual, and the other half of the manuscripts tr transmit the other one. So, Probably, I, I, I'm going to show you now some examples of those manuscripts, right, that I have uh, consulted, right? So, basically here, what uh, uh, Leonicino is discussing is how 
whether you choose one or the other translation or whether you choose one or the other, other variants, it provides a different interpretation. Uh, I think that this dilemma is still there. It's a very difficult passage and you need to, I spent like several weeks working on it because it's very difficult. And in fact, as you see, like modern translation, Boudon, for example, uses the, the Eita variation and uh, Thompson's translation for Le uses the other one. So, I mean, uh, Boudon justifies why she uses, uh, she uses that uh, translation uh, or that variant. And Dionichena, in fact, chooses the other one. Now, I think both are possible, but I like more Leonicheno's uh, uh, choice, right? Because here he's talking about how to evacuate a body, hmm? how to, uh, with the so-called bloodletting, right? How to evacuate a body. And, and this is a section of the Arts Medica where Galen is talking about how to do that, how to perform that, or what are the methods. And I think that Leonicheno is here in order to choose the right variant, there are two things. First, I think that he had the manuscripts, that he had seen the manuscripts that were carrying the disjunctive, the A. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't have, the, have the other manuscripts. That's why he said that uh, Torrigiano and, and the opera, the Translatio Antiqua was, uh, uh, mis, uh, I mean, mistranslated the passage. But in reality, uh, he had he had consulted the manuscripts that many of which are now in the Biblioteca Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, in the Fondo Ridolfi. So these manuscripts that and many of them, a couple of them, have been identified as actually used by Leonicino. Okay, so probably he had the manuscripts that have the A variant, like the disjunctive. Okay, but on the other hand, I think it's very interesting. What he does is he justifies from a medical point of view, right? Why this option is better. And he says that basically what, what Galen is saying here is that there are two methods uh, available, right? Two methods to evacuate the, the body. You can either evacuate the body as a whole, the whole body by bleeding, uh, but this only can happen when the age and the condition of the patient permits it. And then he says that there are other possibility or a to revolve completely to other places what is flowing to the affected part through scarification and incisions. Um, so he says that this method, Leonicino says that this method that is is called revulsion, that is sending to the opposite direction, right? What is affecting a certain part, it can be tolerated by most people. Whereas, I mean, complete venesection, complete bloodletting, there are some weak individuals that cannot tolerate it. So what is, I mean, I think both, possi both possibilities when we read the text make sense. The Leonicino's uh, variant and solution, I think makes sense from the medical point of view because he is justifying, and I think that he is thinking of the medical practices of his time and not only of the text. And moreover, he's also making references to other Galenic texts where this is explained. So he had a wide knowledge of Galen, and for this reason, he could justify his solution, right? the solution he gave. Um, but besides the, the correct solution, I think both are possible. I like more Leonicinus more, if you like. What is interesting here, and in other examples, is the interface between philological expertise, but also medical expertise. So, so humanists that were not specialists eh, had a limited understanding of how to translate a scientific text. Humanists that had some uh, you know, medical training, like you know, who was a, a professor, but also practiced medicine, had other tools to read a, a complicated text difficult, eh, differently. And he could also draw on his experience as a doctor and was what he was seeing done around, right, in, in his time. So, so as I, I would say, so he, even if he does not explicitly say so, Leonicino's solution is very much guided by his knowledge about the Galenic corpus, 
and the ways of evacuating the humors of the body in his reading of the passage. So faced with two variants in the manuscript tradition, I think that his attention to the senses of the passage in connection with bloodletting is what points him to a specific direction, which is not a bad. Um, so here, for example, you see some of these uh, texts yeah, uh, where uh, the different lecciones appear. One, for example, in the first one you have, um, so in, in the first one you have um, one of the variants, I think it's, um, and let me check because I'm, I have lost my paper. Um, the 2270, you have A, and in 2285, you have A. Down. So you have, you see that the manuscripts transmit both uh, possibilities, right? Both versions. And this one is really interesting. This is 2273, manuscript 2273. And here you see that, I don't know whether it's clear, but you have Eta there on the third line. And someone in the margin wrote A. Yeah? And you see there that he uh, says, Nicolaus Gennikenos stigmatiza todia. Okay, so someone was reading this manuscript after having you know, attended Leonicino's lesson or reading uh, Leonicino's. Um, so he was annotating in, and correcting the manuscript based on a, I mean, what he heard Leonicino say or what, 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 or after having read Leonicino's translation of the text. So this is interesting. Okay, and the last bit I just want to, I mean, it's like we can't cover everything in detail, but there's a, another question I may very briefly touch on is the fact that these translations also helped, um, in a way, reshape nature. Yeah. Um, Leonicin is also uh, provides very good examples here. The process of translation uh, raised awareness of, of the difficulties in translation and opened new avenues of research that would soon extend beyond philology and textual criticism. So, especially by reading and contrasting the Greek tradition and the Latin tradition, for example, what he does in Pliny's um, Errors book, uh, he starts bringing to light problems that had to do with the things themselves, right? So with, with not only from a lexical point of view, but also from the point of view of the, of the thing itself, like the substance, the plant, the animal. So the question is, what is this? Okay, so what are we talking about here? And there is a, an interesting example I have been working on in this book, the Pliny et aliorum medicina rollbus, uh, written in 1492. So here there's a, um, there's a section in which, he, in which he deals with this word, kinabaris, hmm? kinabaris. And it's a, this is a very fa it's a fascinating example because he discusses the errors that apparently Pliny transmitted in connection with this substance. Um, I don't know whether you know what kinabaris is, it's, um, but it's very difficult to tell because there are many, many meanings. But what we think of you uh, uh, today uh, with this word kinabar is cinnabar, right? Cinnabar is a mineral, yeah, where, uh, for example, vermilion is, is, is produced, right? And um, so the problem is that Pliny uh, mentioned that this uh, cinnabar, this was actually the blood of um, a dragon and an elephant, right? That had mixed. So he was transmitting this legend that this substance 
cinnabar, right, was actually the blood, the mixture of the blood of an elephant squashed by the weight, uh, a dragon squashed by the weight of an elephant. Uh, Pliny also mentions that uh, this cinnabar was sometimes called dominium, uh, and that it was used by doctors in his time to make antidotes and medicines. Now, Dioscorides says something different about this, and he says that this kinabari should not be confused with minium. He says that this kinabari is imported from Libya, it has a deep red color, and it is used by painters and also by doctors because of its astringent properties, and that's why it's called dragon's blood, he says. Hai hmm? madracondion, dragon's blood. It, at this point, Leoniceno draws the attention to the fact that doctors in his time used cenabro, that is, used cinnabar cenabro, in their recipes. So what happened? They were used, and he says, this is a deadly poison. He says, venenum esse probatur. Okay, so because of the confusion with the names, doctors were using this cenabro, in place of another substance which nobody knew what it actually was, but uh, which was not poisonous. Okay, um, so here is uh, the distinction. What is interesting? So here I you have, um, you know, a number of, of of images that show where the dilemma lies. Right. So you have cinnabar and sanguis draconis. These are the two the two words that are being confused. Basically, what you see is that it's all about red. They're all red substances, right? And in general, they were commercialized as red powder. Uh, the problem is that basically here, there, there are three substances, what I can figure out, I could figure out uh, from reading the sources and a bit of secondary literature, there's not very much on this, is that there were three substances from our perspective. There's true cinabro, true cinnabar, that is uh, mercury sulfur, sulfide, right, uh, that is used for, um, for example, to produce uh, vermilion, that was used to paint. Right? So when uh, this cinnabar was grounded and it was, uh, in, and it was used for painting and to produce vermilion. But then there was minium that had a slightly more uh, orange color, and that's where the word miniature comes from. So it was also used for painting. And then we have this other substance that is called sanguis draconis, which is not in fact uh, a mineral. It's a plant. Mm -hmm. It's a plant that was imported from the East, right? And it's a plant that comes from that tree you see there. So, it, it, I mean, it's like the red sap of a tree. Mm -hmm. So this was, so this was brought from India and uh, the island of Socotra in particular. Okay, this was a very expensive substance because it was imported. And uh, so painters sometimes used it, I mean, to paint, for example, the blood of Christ, uh, because it, it gave this like watery, glossy color. Okay, but it was very expensive. So these, these three substances were confused. But the problem here, what Yonichino is saying is, or the question he's posing is the if we confuse the words and we don't know what we're talking about a doctor reads um, kinabaris in a latin recipe book or or, or in a, you know materia medica and he may administer the mineral uh, or which has mercury and if it's taken in the wrong dose it can kill a person okay so I think this is a very good example because it illustrates the way in which uh, the problem regarding terminology was not just a question of style. It was not just a question of rhetoric and what was better Latin in connection with Greek, but the medical humanists started raising the question that these mistakes regarding uh, the correct identification of, of word, things and words was had could have consequences for the practice of medicine uh, and for the health of patients. Okay, so 
I mean, I'm not going to go any longer. Basically, I'm going to read some of the provisional conclusions. It would, in connection with the different aspects I have, I have mentioned, there were key changes brought about by the incorporation of scientific literature. So there were key changes brought about by the incorporation of scientific literature into the humanist retranslation agenda. First, there were new epistemological questions beyond the discussion of translation methods. Uh, so basically, the discussions was regarding whether you use an ad verbum or an ad sensum uh, method. And this discussion broadened towards the end of the century and began to accommodate epistemological questions such as the status of the realia and their correct interpretation. And obviously, the medical humanists played a crucial role here in this change. It also shows the limitations of the stylistic and rhetoric-based model of translation. So uh, the philology-driven rhetoric-based model of translation enforced by the humanist renovation program started to reveal its own limitations when the Greek scientific literature was incorporated into the agenda. Uh, so this resulted in ever-increasing qualifications and distinctions in terms of discourse genres, uh, a point that was occasionally made by figures like Cartagena in his dispute with Bruni, by Manetti in his translation of the Bible, or by uh, George of Trebizond in his translation of Aristotle's philosophical works. So functional pragmatic criteria in translation slowly began to surface. Uh, not all texts could be translated in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to scientific texts, uh, the recreation of the scribendi ornatus, as Bruni advised, was not as relevant as the accurate rendering of the doctrina rerum. Right? So, uh, so this is, in a way, is a it's a way of going back in time, but it was also a. Uh, an important thing that the translation of, of these medical texts throw into the discussion. Revisiting translation strategies, so this new approach also affected translation strategies. The literalistic word-for-word -word approach of the earlier medieval translators could not be ruled out altogether. And the coinage of neologisms or Greek cults was not in itself flawed if it fostered the correct understanding of the text. Something else that happened was the reconfiguration of the habitus of the translator. So now it was felt that bilingual competence uh, was not only enough to be an optimus interpretus, to be proficient, as Bruni advised, to be proficient in Greek and Latin was not enough to be a good translator. So. In particular, scientific translation required expertise, expertise in specific disciplinary areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the case of medical texts, for example, this in, uh, called for sound philological and textual knowledge, but also empirical expertise. Mm -hmm. Finally, philological uh, Proficiency and medical expertise were invoked by medical humanists as criteria for undertaking translations or retranslating Greek medical texts. Solutions were not solely rest restricted to the best manuscript or variant, but also to the discussion of particular medical problems. And finally, uh, the humanists' engagement with Greek scientific literature by way of translation and interpretation fostered an awareness of the contradictions and inconsistencies of the information transmitted by the classical authors, right? And this, I would say, is one of my hypotheses. This paved the way for an advancement in the study of Materia Medica, a, uh, more largely in the, sec in the following century. There's going to be, there's a big change in the approach to medicine and botany in the uh, 16th century, as opposed to the 15th century, and in a way, these, you know, new 
uh, steps taken by the medical humanists in translating science and, uh, you know, pinpointing the contradictions between the, for example, Pliny and Dioscorides and so on, fostered, yes, these new questions and in a way promoted the, the more experience-based and empirical approaches in the following century. Okay, this is... Grazie. Grazie, non so poi governare tu la discussione. Eh, ecco, non so se ci sono, ci sono già dei ringraziamenti. Mm -hmm. eh, bellissima lezione, eccetera. Non so se ci sono domande scritte. Eh, no, ci sono ringraziamenti. Comunque, chi vuole fare domande sulla chat e eh, libero e anzi benvenuto se le, se le fa. Io ringrazio Gaston Basile per questa lezione molto bella e per la eh, ampiezza di approccio che ci ha mostrato. E è un po' di tempo che eh, anche io personalmente, che sono partito da studi di letteratura proprio purissima, eh, che ha studiato in licei dove i testi scientifici erano considerati non di serie B o C mm. ma proprio spazzatura invece eh, negli ultimi tempi mi sto interessando molto come alcuni dei presenti sanno alla letteratura scientifica in eh, latino eh, sia per esempio i poemi di eh, coltivazione delle piante uno dei quali la Elisa Petri sta pubblicando cioè l'Ortolus di Valfido Sabone sia i, i testi di, dei gesuiti o dei cinesi nel eh, Pechino eh, gesuita di botanica mm. quindi anche quelli in latino in mezzo c'è tutta questa galassia immensa e la tua lezione ci ha insegnato ci ha svelato, almeno a me che non conoscevo e non sospettavo questa ricchezza di aspetti, l'importanza eh, della questione eh, traduttologica eh, in questa materia in generale e nella appunto, funzione di ponte fra culture, fra mentalità scientifiche, fra proprio universi storici differenti. È stata ver veramente una una piccola grande rivelazione questa di, di oggi che insomma ci conforta nel eh, prestare sempre maggiore attenzione alla letteratura scientifica e credo che questo tuo libro che spero si possa concludere quanto prima sarà veramente una, un evento importante per, la, per, i, nostri, per i nostri studi e, lascio ora la, domanda, insomma, la discussione aperta eh, mi permetto di lanciarla io su, su una delle tante questioni che mi hanno interessato. Ora sto parlando così perché penso che sentano meglio, ma non so se è vero o se non sentono nulla a distanza. Eh, una cosa che mi ha colpito, sia in Bartolomeo Scala, eh, che subito mi interesserò per tradurre, perché un, po un poeta umanistico che scrive, secondo me, bene, bene. sugli alberi va tradotto immediatamente. Non so se è stato tradotto. Non lo so. Penso di no, non ho trovato... E questa è tradizione l'ha fatto io. Perché... Commentato. È molto bello, sia lui, sia eh, il traduttore di cui hai mostrato questi est estratti, Niccolò Leono Niceno, partono da un presupposto di... Eh, irrecuperabilità della corrispondenza fra referente e parola ma lo, lo danno per scontato dice siccome non possiamo più sapere come si chiamavano vera, veramente dobbiamo escogitare strategie alternative ecco perché questo pessimismo eh, radicale di partenza posso rispondere cioè rispondo in inglese se volete um... Uh, there was a, in, in this period, there were many discussions regarding, uh, I mean, the use of, um, I mean, there were discussions involving Poliziano, Scala, regarding how to uh, re recover, yes, these, these words that were once used by the Latin uh, and Greek, uh, or basically even the, the Latin poets and the Latin authors in Roman times. And what happened, yes, 
when, I mean, now that we're in this, with the Renovatio Lingua Latina and this, uh, it, so there were discussions regarding, there were very important discussions in this time regarding whether, for example, we were speaking the same Latin as the, as the ancients did. So there was an awareness, this, this is probably, I think, that to my mind is one of the key achievements of humanism is, is awareness that there is a historic gap. I think I don't think that during the Middle Ages there was this idea that we were the, the, the times there was this very clear understanding that our time is there was a historic gap from the past. Mm -hmm. So the humanists were I mean Lorenzo Valla is very important here in and he he very much explicitly uh, puts it this way that the fact that now there is a there is a there is a historic difference and that languages also evolve and languages change. So this is a very important question about the language change because it, I don't think that there was this since Latin was the lingua, fra the lingua franca and was a language that was spoken throughout the Middle Ages. It, I, there was no such clear um, awareness that the language had changed. So there were questions whether are we speaking the same language as Cicero did or whether changes. So. In in this period in the Quattrocento, there was this idea that there was a historic gap. So there we're no longer. A, I mean, this is a distance past, and we want to recover, recuper, recuperate, yes, bring back the classics. And there's also questions about the language, right? The language that we were speaking. Is it? A, and it's a way in which they were also renovating and enriching the Neo-Latin. Yes, this Neo-Latin. That they were speaking, which was not the Latin that the, the I mean, it was not the language that the speaker, the people spoke, right? So they, it was a the academic language, the language of the court, the language of, uh, of chancellery, uh, the language of the church, but it was not the language that the apothecaries or the butchers spoke, right? So they start seeing these divisions between contemporary language, the, the contemporary Latin, the Latin that they were speaking, and how they wanted to improve it. Uh, by comparison from the medieval Latin that they saw as something very barbarian, they used the word barbarian and that it was shoddy and was, you know, they, they rejected it. Uh, so they tried to enrich this Latin. And there were discussions about how to enrich it, whether what authors they should model and they should uh, draw on to enrich this language. Mm -hmm. And as regards the, the, the question of the um, botanical terms, for example, in terms of plants, I think there was this idea that two things. First, that um, these names might have been confused or confusing in the first place. So they started realizing that, for example, Pliny was not very reliable. Right? That Pliny made a lot of mistakes. He was he was using he was also using sources. So he was he was he was drawing on several sources like Dioscorides and other authors, but he had made mistakes. So now they, they, they felt that they had like twice as much effort to do because they had to find the right words, but also find what were the mistakes that, for example, Pliny made when, you know, identifying or talking about animals, talking about uh, substances, talking about pigments and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there was this awareness that uh, there was a ter terminology was a really a difficult, um, you know, uh, area to deal with. La cosa diventa ancora più interessante perché riguarda il confronto, contrasto umanesimo medioevo, mm -hmm. cioè questi intellettuali non conoscevano diciamo, la medicina e la scienza medievale probabilmente, pensavano quindi di doversi ricollegare ai testi di mille anni prima e, e quelli erano veramente troppo lontani, perché il latino cambia, ma i termini tecnici no, per questo mi stupisce che pensassero che non so, la, la salvia era salvia ai tempi di Cicerone, continua a essere salvia nel Medioevo e negli umanisti, non cambia mai il nome. Sì, uh, cioè, some terms, like the one you mentioned, probably yeah. did not change, 
but others, species, uh, they, yeah, species, some species, some species or some, you know, herbs did not change, yeah. but others did change. And this example of dragon's blood is very, is very significant because right. this was confused from Dias Cottages and Pliny's time, right? So the sources were already transmitting something that was confused and it was confused throughout the whole Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have been, I'm writing a paper on this because I think it's a, it's a really interesting case. Uh, this dragon's blood, nobody knew what it was, what it actually was. So some use, it was a red powder. You went to the pharmacy, to the apothecary, and you bought this Sangue Draconis, Sangue di Drago, which was like a red resin, red powder. Sometimes it was, it was also sold as a liquid, as a tear, uh, but nobody knew what it was, okay? So some believed it was a plant, others believed it was a, a mineral, yeah. and the only thing showing that doctors confused it with uh, cinnabar, with uh, ginabro, yeah. yeah, which is vermilion, which is toxic, okay? So I, I think that vernacular medicine was very experimental, and, <laughs> you know, if you were lucky, you got the right thing. If you were not lucky, you were, you were in trouble. Uh... Grazie. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the fascinating lecture. Um, I was wondering uh, what, the, what the role of print is here. Uh, because when you were talking about the big picture that those translations, they were meant to substitute uh, the Greek ones. Uh, and of course, in the beginning of print, that was also the case, but what they could not foresee was in what happened in the 16th century that the Greek texts were actually printed, uh, and, and so the, the Latin texts in a way were reduced to being a help, or, a, or a, not a substitute, but a, but a supplement to the, the Greek texts. So, so uh, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, this whole process also of identifying things, it was helped enormously by, by print <laughs> that you could uh, you you had the uh, 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 one of the slides, uh, yeah, and, and and you know, so so this this, this shift from from manuscript culture to to print, which of course took some decades or even more, uh, must have had an enormous impact on on this whole development. So yeah, you you are raising a very important question. I mean, the question of, of printing, the printing culture. Uh, all these new translations were published. So many of these translations were, I mean, I'm, I'm talking here about the first, like the second half of the Quattrocento. Right? This is where the, these first um, medical and scientific texts were retranslated. And, and I say retranslated because many of them had been translated during the 12th century, as we talked earlier, by Constantine the African, Burgundy of Pisa, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, the, and the great, and they were good translations. But of it, I mean, in general, they were good translations. They were very literal. So I think that there was some some um, aspiration from these humanists to get their translations into print, right? To begin with, right? So they wanted to make new translations because they 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 wanted them into print, and they many of them were printed, but they were printed a bit later. They were printed in the early 16th century they started being printed but many of these translations were made earlier some of these translations were never never reached print like for example george of trebizon's translation of um uh, aristotle's libri naturale was never printed it remained in manuscript and it's still in manuscript mm -hmm. uh in, in on the other hand theodore gaza's translation of uh, Lib um, aristotle's libri naturales and uh, on animals and uh, the problema and so on they were early put into print, right? So uh, I think that the aspiration to get this in print was 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 very important, which does not mean that the manuscript tradition died out. Many, uh, much of the medical, you know, knowledge was still circulated in manuscript form, even even during the sixteenth uh, sixteenth uh, century, and the addition of the Greek texts was important. Of the in the, let me say in the mid 16th century, the addition of these Greek texts was an important achievement. But the truth is that most people were not bilingual, and so most of them relied on translations. So this, from the point of view of the history of culture, is very important because not everyone knew Greek. 
Mm -hmm. So it was more likely that a doctor would know Latin, so he read, I don't know, Leoniceno's translation of Galen, than that he would go to the real Galen text in Greek. Mm -hmm. And not only that, later in the 16th century, they were translated into the vernacular. So then the readership expanded a lot more. So there were more people like there was Dioscorides, for example, was, was translated by Mattioli, um, Pietro Mattioli in the 15, 1530, 1535. So it was translated into Italian, right? Uh, so it was a, a text that was early translated into a vernacular language. And then in Spain, it was translated by, by Laguna, for example, a few years later. So just to take the case of Dioscorides, so he was read in Latin, but then in the 16th century started circulating also in uh, vernacular languages across Europe. But obviously Latin remained the lingua franca for you know, centuries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sul, che riguarda lo studio eh, dei testi scientifici. Non so, puoi chiedere se sei intorno? Ah, sì. No, io appena togliti la maschera, sì. Eh, Avevo due domande metodologiche, in particolare su, sullo studio dei testi scientifici, in particolare relativamente alle erbe e alle piante. Una domanda eh, riguardava testi come l'erbario dello pseudo e quindi se possono avere questi tipi di testi che contengono eh, le immagini delle, delle erbe e l'elenco dei vari nomi eh, assegnati a queste erbe o, o in altri o nomi insomma, dati alla medesima pianta da, da altre popolazioni, se questi tipi di erbari possono essere considerati degli strumenti utili per lo studio, per l'identificazione di una pianta avendo un elenco di, dei vari nomi dati dalle, dalle varie popolazioni, anche se non in modo sistematico, quindi se le è mai capitato di usare un, se le è mai capitato di incontrare per esempio erbari di questo tipo e se possono essere usati. E poi un'altra domanda. Eh, it's a very good question. Eh, I'm... For example, I have been looking into this case of dragon's blood, right, that I'm working on, to see what the herbals, for example, and the um, in the medieval tradition, for example, the Salernitan medicine, like the school of Salerno, that produced uh, this um, various famous, not only herbals, but also um, glossaries. You had this, for example, the, the Chilcain stands, the Alfita, that were all medieval glossaries where uh, you know, substances, some, some of them were bilingual, right? So you had like, what is the name in Latin? What is the name in Greek? What is the name in Arabic? So they were very useful. Some of them started to be illustrated. But the problem here, I think from my experience, I'm not an expert in, in, in botany in particular, but from my experience, the same, the sources of these texts were basically Pliny, those corridors, and then also filtered through the Arabic world, like Serapio, Avicenna, Razis, and all the, uh, the Arabic authors that also on their, in their turn, they, they drew on uh, Pliny, Dalscorides, and so on. Uh, so what I see is that the same information, yes, sort of tends to be repeated in itself, but it does not help very much to the actual identification of a plant. If a plant was, you know, it was very clear that it was, I don't know, pepper, and there was no doubt, everyone knew pepper, there was no problem. But with more difficult substances, the problem is that the, an error was likely to have been transmitted uh, in the tradition, right? And you got came across the same error. Sometimes, for example, what happens with dragon's blood is that, from my, uh, you know, analysis of the sources, is that, um, the Arabic um, text, the Arabic tradition knew this plant, dragon's blood, the tree, right? Because it was a tree that was closer to the east and they, uh, they knew that this uh, tree was called dragon's blood. In fact, the, the name comes from an Arabic term. Uh, dragon's blood. It was called dragon's blood or, or blood of the, of the two brothers. It had different names, right? So 
the, the Arabs uh, the, the, transmitted this information. Constantine the African, right, when he, when he translated in the 12th century, he transmitted something that was correct about this plant, but then it got lost. So from then on, I mean, he translated um, from Arabic this, this about this substance. He says that it was a substance from a tree that grew in India. He said, I think this is in India or in um, Arabia or some of the, um, you know, I, I don't know. He, he gave, gives a very, in Persia, he says, in Persia is a tree that grows in Persia and it has a bark that is sometimes cut and a red sap flows from the tree, but that information then is lost. It's not transmitted in the other in the other um, uh, herbal hel herbals or uh, antidote or pharmacopoeias or it, it, it becomes it, get, it gets lost. Uh, and the same sort of wrong information is retransmitted right, by the different authors. That's I think it's my impression from a, some substances I have been working on that are not easy ones. Now, the easy ones, like I, um, Francesco mentioned, right, like uh, were always known and there was no problem. But the problem was with the difficult ones, right, the ones that are were confused. And there was some, there was a problem with the Arabic, right, the Arabic tradition, because there were certain certain substances that were not mentioned by Dioscorides and were not mentioned by Pliny, or they were wrongly mentioned, but they were known by the Arabs, by the Muslims, right? They, they knew these substances because they came from a different part of the world, right? And they were not very much used in Europe. Or they were known, but, you know, a bit confusingly. Mm -hmm. Last question, se le è mai capitato di dover lavorare con la nomenclatura moderna, quindi dover fare poi il confronto tra il termine latino e la nomenclatura, per esempio, di Linneo che è molto specifica, quindi sapere che il tipo di specie è molto importante e si ha suggerimenti. Eh? You know, this is, you're raising another very difficult problem, which has to do with once you more or less find the species, now you need to see what is the taxonomy, and you have like different modern taxonomies. And you have different species of the same plant, which will look very similar. So, uh, for example, in the case of dragon's blood, which is the one I'm working on, uh, the technical name is Dracaena kinabaris. Mm? Draca it takes the same name. See how, the, how the, even the modern name uses the word kinabaris that is not actually connected to the, to the plant itself. It's, you see, so even the modern terminology draws on a, you know, on a legend or on a mystification that you know, continued over the centuries. So the modern name is Dracaena kinabaris. So it, it describes an, this tree I showed that grows in the, on the island of Socotra, mainly in, 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 the, in the east, and is cut and it produces this red sap. But there are other trees that also produce a red sap. And there's another species that grows on the island of Madeira, Porto Santo, eh, on the Atlantic. And in the 15th century, dragon's blood was also imported from that, eh, from that, uh, from the Atlantic, let's say. And then when they discovered America, yeah, the Americas, they, were, they also found another tree that produced this red sap eh, in Colombia. And it was brought to the Americas. So you see, you never know what it actually was. And, and they, were, they were all called dragon's blood. Mm -hmm. yeah? And in fact, there's a very interesting uh, example. Uh, the famous Monardes, who was the, the, the one who made the first description of the, of the drugs and the herbs that are brought from the New World, from the Indies. He wrote it in the, in the early, sorry, in the late, 15, I think, 1570s, more or less, 1570s. So he wrote this book about these new species that were brought from the Americas. And he created a, like a tree. I don't know whether it's true or not. He said that he had found that a bishop had told him about a tree that was called El Dragon, the dragon tree, that produced uh, you know, the same characteristics. So, I mean, 
there, apparently there is um, a Colombian tree that has similar characteristics, but it was not the tree that we're talking about, the one that grows in India or the one that grows. So he was creating this marketing strategy. Yes, he was he was drawing on a legend or something that was well known in Europe, and he was introducing a new species. So I don't know if I can give you a methodological. You have to struggle, and then you'll see that the problem gets more and more complicated as the more you get into the the, the terminology. Because sometimes there are more than one species, as as even Bartolomeo Scala was mentioning in his poem. Yeah? There were there were different species and different names, and also, you know, um, species or plants are also seasonal, right? You can see them in one season, but then you don't see them anymore. So you know, there's a cycle of nature that makes it also very difficult to identify. Or some plants stop growing in one region. And so for example, in, in Pliny's time, they, they may have grown in, I don't know, in Tuscany, but 2000, or five, one, 2000 years later, 1,500 years later, they may not be growing there anymore. Okay? So the climate changes. So, you know, it's very difficult. Bene, grazie. Ci sono altri interventi o domande? In questo caso allora rinnovo i miei ringraziamenti al professor Basile, eh, al collega Ferrucci e eh, chiudiamo quindi questa serie degli, dei martedì del centro AMA e diamo appuntamento come è stato detto prima a ottobre. Arrivederci grazie, e grazie, grazie a tutti.